us pray. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, loving, eternal, merciful, kind, patient, Heavenly Father, we come to you in this morning on this beautiful Sunday. We gather in your house here at your altar, and we open our hearts to be receptive to what you want to place into us through the activity of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful that we are called and chosen in this time, that we have come and developed an understanding of your love. And we look to enhance that understanding through the experiences that we make here at this living altar. We are thankful that we can gather in a fellowship here where believing Christians gather to be inspired by your Holy Spirit, to listen to your word, to be instructed into the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father in the hopes that we too can grow into that likeness and image, to be completed to be the bride of your Son. We're thankful that you have given us those who lead and guide us in our time in the Apostles. We pray for our chief apostle who leads and directs the apostolate of today. Allow for them, Heavenly Father, a godly inspiration and insight that they may lead and guide us to the goal of our faith, the return of Christ. We gather here in this morning with a variety of hopes and wishes, with thankfulness, but also with cares and concerns. You know the conditions that live in the hearts of each one. You know what your children need. You know what we struggle with. You know the joys and the victories that we have experienced. And Heavenly Father, we place that all here upon this holy altar. Firstly, with our thankfulness, but we combine that too with our petitions that you will provide for us what is good, what is needful, and what is timely. In this morning, we gather and we think of those who are connected through the technologies, but we also think of our loved ones out of the eternal world, those who have already preceded us in, out of this life into the next life. Heavenly Father, they too have this same longing and desire to share in your word, in your love. Let them also experience that today here. We also gather for a special event, a special occasion in the congregation here in Margaret Avenue. A baptism will take place and we pray for that little one that will be baptized for his parents that they too can feel the love and the support of the congregation that surrounds them as they take that vow and that commitment for their child, that they do so with the understanding of your great love. Now, Heavenly Father, attend to our prayer. Let us experience you in a powerful, in a wonderful, in a tender way, for we ask it all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters, my dear friends. We greet you this morning with a Bible word that comes out of the book of John, the 20th chapter and the 28th verse. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Please be seated and our choir can sing. of the choir, Our God Reigns. 
It's really a powerful message for mankind. It was a message that was already shared at the time of Christ's activity when he walked the face of the earth. And it was a message that became very clear in this story where our Bible word is taken from. In this 28th verse of the 20th chapter of John, it says, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas. Some, many, know him as Doubting Thomas. Because he had a, we'll call it the misfortune, of missing out on an opportunity that the other disciples of Christ were able to experience and witness. After the crucifixion of Christ, after he was buried, we know the story of Easter, how Christ arose. And he appeared first to Mary at the tomb. And then she told, went and told the disciples, Christ is risen. As he said, he promised it would happen and it's happened. Well, you know, Thomas gets a bad rap. Because the other disciples, they were like, come on. They had to go see for themselves. Now, one could say, justifiably, that they doubted. Yet Thomas is the one who gets the rap of being the doubter. Days after the resurrection of Christ, the disciples, who were very close with Christ, spent three and a half years with him, learning from him, in his inner circle, were witnesses of him. They were in a state of disillusionment. They were afraid because they had just witnessed this teacher, their master, come to a very brutal and cruel demise. Even though Christ told them all of what was going to happen, what they witnessed with their eye, what they experienced, created in them a significant amount of fear and concern. Because they were with Christ. And they were afraid that those who brought Christ to his end would look for them next. So they were very sure to be very secretive of where they were, their whereabouts. And here they gathered in a room. They locked the doors so that those who might seek to do them harm as well couldn't get in. And then through these locked doors, how it transpired, what took place, what we do know through the recordings and scriptures is that Christ appeared to them. He came into their midst. And the words that he gave them were peace be unto you. That peace be unto you was a traditional greeting amongst the Jewish people. But the intent of Christ giving that specific message, that specific greeting, was far deeper than just a casual greeting. It was to set their hearts at rest. To give them a peace. To give them a contentment. Knowing that what Christ had told them that Christ is alive. That everything that he had said would transpire up to that point has taken place. And he defeated death and has arisen as he promised. Those disciples that were present there, I'm sure were overwhelmed with joy. I'm sure they were contented in a state of peace that they could not get prior to that. But Thomas wasn't there. Doesn't say why he wasn't there. One could perhaps surmise the fact that Thomas took the death of Christ very hard. Not that it wasn't difficult for everyone, but when you go to understand Thomas, there's not a lot said about him in scriptures. 
In fact, his name only comes up in 12 verses of the entire New Testament. Four of those verses, there's just a reference to him in being one of the disciples of Christ. Eight of those verses take place in the book of John and the recordings that John wrote of what transpired. One of those verses in John can be found in the 11th chapter, the 16th verse. It says, Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now that wasn't in reference to the crucifixion. That was in reference to the story when Lazarus had died and Christ learned of this, that his friend had died and he wanted to go to where he was. The disciples discouraged him and said, don't go there, they want to stone you to death. They want to end you. He had to flee Judea because of that. Now, why would you want to go back? Thomas, with a conviction, he said, friends, let's go with him. Even if we have to die, let's go with him. So when you, when you look at it from the perspective that Thomas has for 2,000 plus years been given this name Doubter, but that was the conviction that he had prior? What changed? What changed was Christ was crucified. He died a brutal death. And Thomas witnessed this. But he didn't witness this as a testifier of Christ. Like he did when he was willing to go with him to Judea, to Bethany. He witnessed it from afar. One could say maybe as a bit of a cowardly position. Because he didn't acknowledge himself as a follower, as a believer of Christ. So that depth of pain, that depth of regret, that conscious decision really had an effect, had an impact on Thomas. And maybe that's why he was alone. Have you ever been so depressed and in such a despair that you didn't want to be with anybody else? You just needed to be alone. Sure, we've experienced that to greater or lesser degrees in our lives. Maybe that's where Thomas wasn't there. But when he came into the fellowship of the disciples, they, with great joy, with great excitement, shared with them, this is what happened. Christ came. He appeared to us. He revealed himself to us. He is alive. <laughs> Thomas, he said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it unless I can put my finger into his wounds. Unless I can see him and do that physical, get that physical proof. He missed one occurrence. See what happens when you don't come to church once? You miss things. You miss opportunities. You miss insights. And because of the missed opportunity, Thomas was left in a position where he was filled and riddled with doubt. Now there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Some might think that they're the same or very closely connected, And in many ways they are. But the difference lies in where it originates. I read a beautiful definition or description and it said that doubt is a problem of the intellect. You want to believe, but you just have questions that need to be answered. Whereas unbelief is a problem of the heart. It doesn't matter what you see or what you hear. You choose not to believe it. Because it doesn't coincide with your way of thinking. It doesn't coincide with your will and your wishes. Thomas didn't have the unbelief. 
He had the doubt. And let's face it, if we're honest, if we look introspectively at ourselves, who doesn't doubt? Think many times of how many brothers and sisters have come and said, pray for me, I have to go through this test or I have to go through this operation. And what generally do we hear back? Leave it in God's hands. Trust in God. Yeah, is it that easy? There's always that little piece of doubt that says, yeah, but what if God doesn't have time to attend to me right now? Or what if maybe it doesn't work out the way that I hope? We've all experienced doubt. We've all come under that condition. But you know what is so beautiful about the story of Thomas? Which also is a clear indication and an example for us of the grace of God. Almost the exact same experience that the disciples that were there when Christ revealed himself took place eight days later. There they were gathered in a room, still locked doors. This time Thomas was there. Thomas was in attendance with the rest of the disciples of Christ. And again, Christ appeared in a similar fashion to what he did. He didn't knock on the door. They didn't unlock it. He appeared to them. He came into their presence. And he turned right to Thomas. And he said, peace be unto you. And then he said, put your finger in my wounds. Put your finger in my side that you can see, that you can experience what it is you needed in order to believe. The same experience. Christ could have admonished him. He could have criticized him. He could have ridiculed him for his unbelief. But he understood and he, he addressed his doubt. And it was a powerful encounter for Thomas. So much so that he could speak the words of our Bible verse. There's different interpretations, different writings of what took place. Whether Thomas actually physically had to touch the wounds of Christ or not is unknown. But he came to an understanding and a realization where he could say, with conviction, with authority, with power. My Lord and my God. There was no doubt. There was no unbelief. There was no uncertainty. There was surety. There was confidence. There was 100% faith that this was God manifest in the Son. What does this mean for us? Don't miss coming to church. It's number one. We have an opportunity to hear and experience God every time we come into his presence. New revelations are given to us. New understandings of how much God loves us are provided every time we come into his house. that God addresses our unbelief and our doubts. He can change our hearts. Sometimes we say, I just can't believe that. I choose not to believe that. Look what he did with the Apostle Paul. Paul transitioned from a persecutor of Christians to probably one of the most powerful advocates of Christ. That's a changing of a heart. There's not a lot written about Thomas recorded in scriptures after this occurrence with Christ. But it is understood that he became one who testified and professed about Christ. He traveled into the subcontinent, into India, 
And there he died for his faith. This transition that takes place. The Lord Jesus, he said, it's better to believe without having to see than to have something, I'm paraphrasing here, than to have to be proven for you to believe it. Have you ever seen Christ? I mean, other than in an image? When you stand here, you can see, and it's brought up many times, there's two perspectives of the Lord Jesus Christ. One in the stained glass there and one in the stained glass there. We feel the presence of Christ. We feel the activity of Christ in our lives. But we haven't really seen him, yet we believe. We have come to an understanding. When we come to that same level of maturity in faith, that here Thomas, where he could say, my Lord and my God, where we have that conviction of faith that's powerful, What transpired after the events of these revelations of Christ to the disciples is they were changed. They were no longer afraid. They were no longer concerned for their own personal well-being. They understood the plan of salvation. They understood that Christ had defeated the powers of evil, the power of death, had defeated sin, And they were filled with a new conviction, a new understanding. My dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters, it is the will of our Heavenly Father. It is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the teachings of the Holy Spirit that we too come to that same understanding. That we don't live in a state of doubt, but that we believe. That we apply our faith to our belief that we share our faith, that we testify of the love of God, that we experience it in great and powerful ways. When that happens, then we are these legible letters, these witnesses of Christ, and we can share those experiences with credibility. When somebody has lived through something, they know what it's like. Have we lived through the understanding that God loves us? Have we come to the understanding that we are the children of God and what he wants us to experience, not only today in our natural lives, but into an eternal future, that he allows us to make those experiences? Let's be joyful. Let's find great excitement in this plan that God has for mankind. We are part of of the most beautiful promise ever given to man. Let that be our joy and our surety. Amen. Together as a congregation, we can sing the middle hymn, number 13. We'd also ask our priest Hobson to share his heart. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. I'm double checking right now if it's priest or shepherd. Priest, Lindner. 
we changed rankings a little while ago. Priest Lindner, even in the sacristy, was very consistent coming up here and what he said back there is that doubt quite often is a matter of the heart and not of the mind. And it doesn't often happen when we're at our best. What leads us into the darkness? It usually isn't money, wealth, fame. That tends to put God on the back burner, doesn't it? You still kind of believe in him, but we're doing pretty good. Yeah, I'll get to church. But the wealth and the success and the good times, they can be equally as dangerous as what we're talking about today, the doubt aspect. And doubt hits you when you're weak, even if you don't want to admit that you're weak. Have you ever thought that God doesn't exist? Me too. Have you ever thought that maybe him coming back from the dead, Jesus coming down and not being invincible is a bit of a stretch? Me too. Or maybe that the religious institution is full of it. I've thought that. We all do. There's no difference between us. But it lasts longer for some. And it's shorter for others. How does the doubt start? There was about five, 30-something, 40-something men in in the church and They're all young fathers. We would all hang out in the basement, and I don't know why, but I like intrusive questions. And one day I just decided, why didn't you become a minister? Why? How come you don't feel like getting involved? In not so many words, a little nicer, but... And they all had two or three reasons. But the most common, there was one that hit all five. And one of the reasons was a minister older than them wronged them. defaced them in a group, treated them like less than. I wasn't expecting that. I thought it would be an intellectual thing like God is hard to understand or there's some doctrine thing that I can't get over. They were there, but that was the common one. So that puts a wedge in. Then what do we do? We go, well, the mental superiority kicks in. It's, it's a stretch to believe in an omnipotent being in the sky, you know, sky daddy, right? It's hard to believe that he just made everything and that he's still around and he cares what I'm eating for breakfast or what I'm doing in my day-to-day life. You start doing that, right? And then you push it even further. Even if he's real, in the Old Testament, he was a jerk. And you start hating him. And it's one step at a time, isn't it? But is it him? He's not the one that changed. He's never the one that changed. He's always there. He's always real. There's no science that's disproved him. In fact, everything that we discover seems more like let there be light. My dear brothers and sisters, it's us. And when we're in that weak moment, we can decide if that pain is going to separate us or we can decide if that pain is going to bring us closer. We all know people that have died. We could blame him. Or we could trust him. That this is not the end. They have somewhere else to be, too. There's more work. It's not black. It's a whole other world on the other side. There's a whole new world that has to happen here. So we will use the crutches of science. We will use the crutches of high fluent philosophy, even though something never comes from nothing. My dear brothers and sisters, we have to find a way that in suffering we can save and we can gather strength. We all know people like that. There's someone in our family, it's a grandma, it's a grandpa, it's an uncle, it's an aunt, and they just get hit every single year. And they go, praise God. He is with me. And they're the strongest people you ever met, aren't they? We need to find that. Christ showed us that death is strength. That you can win in suffering. 
and that maybe the success is the danger. That maybe if things are going very easy, and if this world is the dominion of the evil one, maybe easy is dangerous. Maybe it should be a little bit hard. What beliefs have we stood for that people have resisted recently that hasn't been a lot for me, if I'm gonna be honest? The world, this fallen world, is a little bit too easy and a little bit too nice to me, which tells me I'm probably not speaking the truth that often. Let's lean into it, dear brothers and sisters. Yeah, it might be hard. Yeah, we might be suffering. But he warned us. He told Thomas, the world will hate you because they hated me first. He told all the disciples that. And then maybe if we, in our suffering, in all the hard times, we come closer to him, then we'll hear that. We'll hear what Thomas heard. Peace be with you, my child. And it's fine to doubt. So long as we are open to the answer, that leads us back to God. And we could argue back and forth intellectually. An atheist could out-argue me. Absolutely. Can't be true for this, that, and the other thing. You could argue back. This whole universe is fine-tuned. One slight decimal change here, work, gravity doesn't work. But does that matter? Or is it really our heart? Is it really our heart that matters? And it usually does in the end. Amen. When you look at the encounter that the disciples had with Christ, it began with the assurance, peace be with you. And in the case with Thomas, it ended with the conviction of the phrase of the statement, my Lord and my God. What prevents us from transitioning through that period? of getting the peace of Christ and coming to the understanding that Jesus is God. That he is God for us. It's sin. Sin is the only thing that creates that doubt. It's the only thing that creates the opportunity for the uncertainty. Yeah, but Christ, he defeated it. He beat it. So when he says, peace be with you, our immediate response can be, my Lord and my God. That's how we should feel. But that sin, it gets in there. It keeps coming back. It keeps attacking. This is why we have the forgiveness of sin. This is why Christ established that vital component in this plan. And then he also established the sacrament of Holy Communion. That Christ could say, worthily, justifiably, your sins are forgiven, which we will hear shortly. And then we can experience and receive the power in the body and blood of Christ. There will come a time, hopefully, in our maturity, in our development, where that transition from peace be with you to my Lord and my God, that there's nothing that separates them. Until that time, we have grace. Until that time, we have the forgiveness of sin. Until that time, we have the celebration of Holy Communion. In preparation for this, we have... Our choir will sing our hymn of repentance. Please remain seated.
we want to stand and pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the commission of my sender, the apostle, I proclaim unto you the glad tidings that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, your sins are forgiven and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Loving Father, with a real happy and thankful heart, we come to you as your children, we gather in your house, we experience your word, we've experienced your forgiveness, and that creates a trembling in our hearts and souls, not of a fear, but Heavenly Father, in a recognition and an understanding of your greatness, of your power, of your glory, and we bring our combined hearts of thankfulness to you. We're thankful that we can celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, to share in that the earning of Christ, the body and blood of the Lord Jesus that gives us the strength and the conviction to carry on until his return. Let that be each one's experience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We ask the congregation to please be seated. This morning we have a baptism that we're excited in the congregation whenever a new life is born, when a new life is brought to be baptized. The choir will prepare the way with a hymn, and Tony and Natalie, together with Elijah, we invite you to the altar. to position ourselves as best we can so that everybody can see. Apologize for those maybe in that section, but somebody has to lose out. So, Tony, Natalie, little Elijah, I welcome you to the altar of Jesus Christ. I'm going to try my best to hold my emotions in check. The choir just sang at moments like these. As a minister, this is one of my favorite things to be able to share with God's children. A baptism of a child is an expression, a profession of faith, where parents bring a child to the altar to acknowledge a belief in Jesus Christ and an expression out of your hearts that you want your little one this precious bundle of joy, also to share in that understanding and that belief. 
And that is something that God is so happy, so eager to bless. You have come already months ago with the desire, expressed the desire to have little Elijah baptized. And at that time, I already started thinking about how beautiful the experience of you coming into our congregation has been for, for us, for you, and for so many. You came in unknown. A girl from Renfrew, Ontario, which we have some connection to, a man originally from Nigeria, came here into this congregation in Kitchener. If anyone questions the drawing power of the Almighty God, here's proof. Here's living proof of how that connection that God wants us to have with him drew you into this fellowship. When we first sat and talked and you shared how welcome you felt here, it did my heart good. Firstly, because you're easy to love. Your family is easy to love. And you've shared your hearts with all of us, and we've made those experiences together, which brings us to this point today. What you vow today for little Elijah is that you have a belief in Jesus Christ. You have a belief in the faith of the New Apostolic Church, and you have a desire to bring your son, your child, up with that same faith and that same understanding. I know this is your wish. I know this is your desire because you specifically asked for it. You didn't have to be asked, hey, do you want to have your child baptized? You asked for it. And that already creates that, that perfect connection to the Lord Jesus with the desire to want to be in his fellowship and in his family. So I ask the congregation to please rise. A congregation that surrounds you, a congregation that supports you, a congregation that loves you. I will ask you before the congregation and before the Almighty God, is it your wish as parents, is it your desire to bring Elijah to the altar of Christ to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive that power, that glory, to have those sins washed away, not the characteristics that you both have that you will see in him as he grows, but those inherited sins, the baptismal waters, they wash that away. Is this your wish? Is this your desire? Then please answer with your yes. Yes. We can pray. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have heard the yes word here of your, your children, Heavenly Father, of Tony, of Natalie, for their little Elijah. Crown your blessing with that yes word, that Heavenly Father, they can experience it in a wonderful, in a powerful, in a magical way. For we ask it in Christ Jesus' name. I now consecrate this earthly element of water in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the purpose of holy baptism. Amen. I baptize you, Elijah Anthony, in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Receive you now the baptismal blessing. In the name of God, your Father, your Creator, the one who calls you, who loves you, who has this plan for each one of us as his children, that he will provide for you the assurance, the guidance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior and your Redeemer, who died for you, who gave of his life for you, who sacrificed for you because of his great love for you. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, your comforter, your counselor, and your guide, who will provide for you the assurance and the understanding 
that he will allow you to experience his greatness, his glory, his power through the Holy Spirit when it's called upon. It will mold, it will fashion you, it will provide for you all good things that come out of the heart of our Heavenly Father. Receive you the blessing also of your parents and of your lineage, of your heritage, who will also provide for you the guidance and the love to carry on in this path of faith. Be with your parents that they too can experience the power and the support of the congregation, the love of Christ, to maintain and bring you up in this faith, to grow in your understanding and your experience of this faith, and that you can develop in maturity, knowing that you are loved by God. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. The power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God be with you. Amen. Amen. So, congratulations. So happy to have you with us here. Congratulations. Maybe one picture. So always one last one. Thank you. So you can take your seats. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought eternal valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for many for the remission of sin. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this blood and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Oh, can you serve that side? The body and blood of Jesus given for you. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. So the congregation can be seated, and all those who have a belief in Jesus Christ are welcome to celebrate in Holy Communion.
we can stand and close in prayer. Loving Father, with thanks, we come to you at the close of these moments. We're thankful for what you have provided. We're thankful for the little one that could also be added into the ranks of the congregation through the baptism. We're thankful for their family circle that could gather with us. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters who are here in this morning, who are those who are connected via the technologies for our loved ones out of eternity. Carry on with us. We're thankful that we could bring our offerings, and we ask that your blessing rest upon the offerings of your children. Bless the hands that have worked and labored in your house, amongst your children, amongst your people. Let us continue to grow in the image of your Son. Let us grow in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, that soon we can experience the day of his return. We ask this all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. We have a closing hymn by our choir.